got a Kevin um, call from Brother Kevin Romer here several days ago. As most of you know, Brother Joe Ben passed away. Well, Sister Violet apparently is coming back to the Independence area, and they're going to need help unloading a truck when they get here. So if any of you are able physically to help them unload, it would be appreciated. You need to contact Bishop Kevin Romer for the date of this, if you would. Last Sunday at 4.30, we had a, a historical presentation by Apostle Rodney Walsh. Next Sunday at 4.30, Brother Walsh will present another presentation on the historical aspects of this church. And after the presentation, there will be an ice cream social. So make your plans for that, and you can bring whatever topping you wish to for your ice cream. You'll notice the t statistical report in your bulletin this morning. Our income up against our expenses were $1,061 short. So we need to remember that and make our donations if we can to try to alleviate some of this situation. Uh, hopefully, when we combine, if in, that takes place later this year, things will improve. Thank you. Our brother Ian Wilson has an announcement he would like to make, so please listen to this. Hello, everybody. As you know, or if you didn't know already, I am planning to rebuild the, our bridge for my Eagle project, and there's going to be flyers available for it out here after this service. There is a GoFundMe page. We're going to be trying to raise $3,000 to rebuild the bridge and you can either pay us through check which you can make that payable to my father Eric Wilson you can pay in cash or you can scan the QR code on it to go to my GoFundMe page that I've created
Amen. Indeed, let's praise the Spirit and the Father and the Son. And that is what we come here to do this, this morning in our service. And we thank you, the bakers, for offering your gifts to do so and to, to uh, offer them back to the Father. And uh, what an appropriate way to, to start our service this morning. And I, I do welcome you and the brothers and I up front welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ to uh, the Sunday morning service. And uh, if you'll notice, um, one of us up here is not like the others. <laughs> and for those of you on live stream or don't know what I'm talking about, well, these three men are all uh, in the same family by marriage, uh, and they're also all 70s. So I'm the one that's not like the others, but uh, I did uh, invite them up here to, uh, to serve, and it is my my uh, privilege and honor to serve our Lord and Savior with, the, with these men. Um, I have known our speaker uh, of the hour, Brother uh, Derek, for a while now, mostly through activities, uh, youth activities our kids have been involved with, and uh, I know his heart to serve the Lord and to uh, his zeal to, uh, to give the message today. And so uh, I look forward to uh, his message, and I know... Uh, uh, hopefully you do as well. Uh, as a call to worship, uh, I've chosen Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Lift up your heads, O ye generations of Jacob, and be ye lifted up, and the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, who is the King of glory, shall establish you forever. Would you open your hymnals to hymn number 210, Holy Spirit, come with power.
Almighty God, our Father in heaven, with great joy do we come before you this day, this opportunity that we have been given to come and to praise your holy name. And indeed we seek, Father, that Holy Spirit of yours that it might abide with us, that it might indeed burst upon us, that it might empower us, that it might be in, in our hearts and, and swell them, Father, into uh, that great humility and even uh, uh, repentance, Father, that we might come before you this day with those broken hearts and contrite spirits, that we might be able to be those children, those sons and daughters, uh, worthy of your love. And uh, Lord, we know that indeed we fall short, but we know of the great sacrifice and the love of your Son that uh, he gave for us for this opportunity to come and to worship freely and to accept him as our Savior as we know that he is and our King. And we thank you so much for this knowledge and this gift that you've given us so graciously. And will you now look upon us in favor that we might uh, have that spirit to be with us, to uplift us, to encourage us, uh, to uh, bless our brother as he stands in thy stead and to uh, break that uh, bread of life with us, Lord, that we might move out to continue to be successful in bringing thy kingdom to pass and that truth unto those that are so, uh, so needed. And so, Lord, we love you this day. We lift our voice unto you as a congregation, as one, and I pray for all these things in thy Son's most holy name. Amen. From Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he not provide for you, if ye are not of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? A few of us uh, went to... Uh, uh, a concert Friday night. Uh, it's a Christian concert called Winter Jam, and it's um, many Christian artists and motivational speakers and they come and they uh, do this tour across America every every year. And something unique about it is it only costs ten dollars to get in, and it's really a free will offering. If you can't pay the ten dollars, they still let you in. And uh, they do that on purpose, and, they, uh, and they've said, said as much, so that everybody can have an opportunity to come and uh, hear the message and be a part of the experience. And, but during the, the, the show, they, they do take an offering. And this is at the Sprint Center, you know, and I don't know how many that holds, 15, 20,000 people, and it was pretty full. But they take an offering. And they, they have, the, they call them their bucket crew, come out and they pass the bucket down the Sprint Center. And their belief is that um, obviously they can't operate that show and have all these Christian artists come on $10 at the door. But they believe that the Lord will provide and that through that offering, that free will offering uh, at the concert and in other means that they can continue to offer this ministry. And, uh, and they have for s several years now. I've seen them do that. So likewise, um, you know, as, as Joe made mention of our, our budget deficit, and we have a, a young man uh, raising projects for the, the uh, funds for the, the bridge repair. We don't know all the ways that God has in store and how he might provide to take care of the needs of the building. Even Dan and I, our Sunday school class, was mentioning um, other things in the building that that uh, that need need attention, but um, but we trust in God's word and what He says that He that to take no thought of tomorrow that He has a plan and that He will find a way to to see that the needs of the church uh, are met and that the, the work can can continue. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious Heavenly Father. 
Lord, as we uh, contemplate our offering now, and whether it be financial or in other ways that we contribute to the work of the church, may you uh, help each one understand their part and their need and how they can uh, make an offering and that they can uh, contribute their talents and gifts to the kingdom and to the cause. And we do hope, as we do each week, Father, that you can take and do only what you know how and how to multiply it and have it spread and work all the needs and all the, the things that need to be, to be done. And that the work of this church is not just here in the center place, but it extends all across America and across the globe. And uh, we desire to continue to do that work. And uh, we hope that uh, this offering might meet its intended purpose. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a blessing to stand here amongst you and to greet you this morning and to be a part of this service in any way, shape, or form, uh, but to uh, stand here and speak. And I felt the uh, prayers, I've, I've heard a lot, of, a lot of people tell me that they've been praying for me, and I felt them all, and my prayers have been for you this week in preparation, asking that the Lord might give me the things that you need to hear, that we might all Collectively, we'd be, be, able, we'd be blessed, but uh, you've been in my thoughts and prayers, and uh, I felt your prayers as well. I can't, I can't not acknowledge the beautiful setting that was, that was given to us here uh, by our, our brother and our sister, how, how beautiful that was, and I pray that we never take advantage of that or never, never look past that, take that for granted. That was a tremendous offering that you gave and I, uh, I very much appreciate. I very much appreciate the offering that you just gave to the Lord there, and how truly blessed we all are that we were able to uh, feel the sweet spirit that came with that. So thank the both of you for that beautiful message. And if you've ever stood up there, you know it's not an easy task. And boy, he made he, he made that look easy. It was a beautiful message. And my brother Eric uh, said that he's he's unlike us. First off. You're, you're our brother in Christ, so you are our family. But number, number two, uh, we haven't reached the number 490 yet, so you, you could be a 70 at some point in time. So, But that being said, it's a blessing to be here. And before I give a sermon up here in this, uh, uh, this scripture reading, I want to go ahead and read to you the scripture reading that's been placed on my heart this day. And I battled with this and... Uh, 
You know, the Lord reveals himself in, inside of sermons sometimes. If you've ever given a sermon up here, sometimes the Lord calls on you to do something. You don't understand why. But uh, reading from the sixth chapter of Genesis, starting with the 32nd verse. And when Enoch had heard these words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord and spake before the Lord, saying, Why is it that I have found favor in thy sight? And am but a lad, and all the people hate me, for I am slow of speech. Wherefore am I thy servant? And the Lord said unto Enoch, Go forth, and do as I have commanded thee, and no man shall pierce thee. Open thy mouth, and it shall be filled, and I will give thee utterance. For all the flesh is in my hands, and I will do as seemeth, good, seemeth me good. Say unto this people, Choose ye this day to serve the Lord God who made you. Behold, my spirit is upon you, wherefore all thy words that will I justify. And the mountains shall flee before you, and the rivers shall turn from their course. And thou shalt abide in me, and I in you. Therefore, walk with me. Once again, thank you so much for that. That was a beautiful, beautiful song. It's a beautiful, beautiful message you've given to us. Uh, that would be a good one to end on right there. But unfortunately, you still have me here, so we'll keep on going. When I was a young man, a boy, I should say, when I was a boy, um, 
Some of you might still think I'm a young man, but I feel like I'm an old man, so don't get old if you don't have to. It's, it's not fun. Uh, but when I was a boy and we would take trips, we didn't have phones. We didn't have all the games that all the kids have and all the electronic devices. There were some little itty-bitty things that we had here and there, but uh, my parents didn't always buy that stuff for us because we didn't need it. And so we had to use our imagination. We had to play games with each other. We had to look each other in the face, which is something kids nowadays don't understand or don't comprehend. Um, if you ask the kids to talk to each other, they just kind of look at each other dumbfounded, like, I don't know what you're wanting me to do here. But we, uh, we'd play games in the car, and I remember my sisters liked the game called MASH. And uh, it stood for mansion, apartment, shack, and house. And you played this game where you'd list all these things, and it was, I don't even remember how it was played, but it was kind of the roll of the dice or whatever, where you'd end up on certain things and it would tell you what your future was going to be like. And our parents did their best to teach us about the Lord Jesus Christ and, and his work, and even more importantly, his work in these latter days. And so we grew up with the concept of Zion. We grew up with an understanding of that. And uh, I remember as a child that I was sad when we played that game thinking, we won't get to experience all these different milestones in our life. You know, one of them was what car you get. That was one of the categories on this game. And I always wanted a Mustang. And so I thought, I'm not going to get a chance to get my Mustang. I don't know if I'm ever going to have a chance to get married. Because life as we know it's going to change because the kingdom was coming. Which good for my parents for getting us to believe it that much. But shame on me for being as ignorant as I was at that moment in time. Um, but we were sad that we weren't going to get to experience those milestones in life that we, as we saw it at the time because we thought that Zion would preclude those things. And that was obviously our childish ignorance, not understanding. But we didn't understand because we didn't treasure, or we treasured what we knew versus what was an abstract thought to us. Zion was a concept. Zion wasn't a reality to us. Zion was something that we didn't understand. It wasn't something we could grab tangibly. Zion was a concept, an abstract thought that was out there somewhere in the ether uh, that we couldn't lay our hands on. We couldn't fathom. And so we were, we were sad as young children, not getting the, to have the things that we saw everybody else in the world had, all the things that we desired. Because if you know anything about kids, when you had your own kids or if you have kids still, Kids always want to grow up fast. They always want to be adults. They want to get to the things. My daughter, she, she thinks that she can do anything and everything. And one of her uh, favorite phrases is, uh, I can do it. I can do it. And anytime she does that you do anything, she wants to do it herself. She doesn't want anybody to help her because she wants to be an adult. She wants to mimic what we do. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. But for us in this instance, we wanted to be adults. We wanted to have the things adults had, the things that we treasured. And that was a clue as to what we treasured in life. And this is what makes this gospel hard in a lot of ways. The gospel of Jesus Christ isn't an easy road, as I'm sure all of you can attest to. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ requires a lot of us. Faith is one of the key ingredients to Christianity. And it's one of the toughest things, because what do we know faith is? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen, right? Unseen, that's the hardest thing for a man to, to, to grasp. And so we have to agree to things on faith in the beginning as we walk. And if you've ever done the slides of the church, you know there's two steps that go into the doors of the church. The doors of the church are baptism. But the steps going up are, number one, faith, and number two, repentance, Probably two of the toughest tasks you'll face as a, as a human being. But the belief of faith is what we are called to do. And while it might be one of the hardest, it's also one of the most beautiful aspects of the church. And you know, it's ironic that so many in the world reject the idea of faith. They reject the idea that, that they uh, should have to believe in something they can't see. How many times do you hear that? Well, I don't see God. You know, show him to me. Prove him to me. But that's the beautiful thing about God, is that it's not us that prove anything. It's us accepting to where God will then prove himself to us after we've used that faith and demonstrated faith. But it's ironic that the world says that in large major, because they, we all use faith every day. I could ask for a show of hands of how many have been to Antarctica, and I, I would imagine that not a single person in here has been to Antarctica. Not really a friendly place you want to go, not a family destination per se. But you believe it's there, right? You believe it exists based off the pictures, the testimonies of others. 
So they use faith. We all use faith every day to believe that certain aspects of our life exist, that certain things are real. Now that faith is oftentimes placed in other human beings, other people, based off of what they say. But the Lord calls us to use that faith as well, to place our faith in him, not in human, not in man, not in the arm of flesh. But it truly is one of the most beautiful aspects because it's something that is undeniable. When you've used faith, and when God turns that faith into knowledge in us, and we allow him to, to, to take that faith and turn it into knowledge, it's something that's unshakable. It's a foundation that can't be broken because you know it came from a place that was not a temporal place, not a, a, a physical place. We knew that it came from somewhere on high. I was listening to the radio the other day, and I don't even remember what channel it was, but I remember hearing uh, Phil Robertson the, the, the father of the, the Duck Dynasty family, if you've ever seen that show, all the guys with the big long beards that make the duck calls. And uh, he was talking about this world as it is. And he's, a, he's an interesting character in himself, and I, uh, I really appreciate some of the things he says. He's a real Christian man, and is always preaching uh, uh, the gospel of the Lord as he sees fit. And I don't know if you know much about him. And I'm, I didn't really intend to give a, a biography of Phil Robertson up here, but he... Uh, he walked away from a lucrative football career, and I can't remember which Louisiana college he was playing at, but uh, Terry Bradshaw was his backup, if you didn't know, didn't know that. But uh, he was a, a terrific guy and a terrific football player, a terrific quarterback, and could have probably gone pro but chose not to, mainly because uh, it would interfere with his, his hunting season. Um, so that being said, uh, Phil Robertson was talking, and he quoted Romans chapter 1, verses 28, or verse 28. So I'm going to go to that if you have your scriptures flipped there as well. Romans, the first chapter, the 28th verse. And I might go back just a, a couple verses here. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with the 28th verse. And even as they did not like to retain God according to some knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do things, to do those things which they thought or which are not convenient. And when he talked about this, he talked about how the world doesn't see the importance of God, how they don't treasure up God, how they don't grasp Him because He's not in their in their their uh, straightforward vision. He might be in their peripheral, or He might not even be in in their their uh, the landscape of their their eyesight. But that uh, they've chosen not to treasure Him. They've chosen not to retain him in the knowledge of him. They might acknowledge him, they might see him, uh, but they choose not to uh, put him as, as the most important thing in their mind. And I've thought about that because as myself, as a child, uh, I wanted the things in the world uh, that the world made look important. I wanted, as a child, to, to uh, have, you know, my whatever car I wanted. I wanted to have a house uh, I wanted to see what I would be like in comparison to the rest of the people, to see how successful I could be, see what I could achieve in life. And I wanted that versus what I didn't understand. And that's the way of the world. You know, I, I, we're, we're quick to condemn as Christians, and, I, and I'm, I'm the chief of, of, of that, that we, we're quick to condemn others in the world and say, well, they are, they're sinners or, you know, they're, they're heathens or uh, they're awful people. And, uh, Boy, especially when you get into the politics, if, if somebody politically doesn't agree with you, they're an awful human being. And I'm, I, I can't say that I'm not guilty of saying things like that or, or being upset at someone. When in reality, and I've had to, had to teach my boys because I've, I've unfortunately set, up, set that off, I think, in my boys to where if somebody doesn't agree that they, uh, they look at them uh, sideways. But uh, I've had to teach my boys now that I've, I've realized my own error that the world oftentimes doesn't understand these things and doesn't choose these things because they haven't been shown these things. And that as myself as a child, my, my parents taught me about Zion, but there's only so much you can grasp through the words of your parents. You have to experience it to understand it. You can't, you can't appreciate what Zion is and what Zion can be unless you've been in a setting like that. And if anybody's been into a, a, a good retreat, I remember going out to those retreats in Colorado and the beauty of watching all the people. It was one of those retreats where we actually did everything ourselves by hand. 
We would go in and we'd clean and we'd cook our own food, all this stuff. We didn't have cooks or anything like that for us. we do our own thing. And we lived together in a community setting. And the beauty of watching everyone fill a station and the beauty of watching each other look to the needs of their brother over themselves and watching everyone sacrifice their time that they could go into the tabernacle and worship the Lord and watching the little breakout groups of, of people having song sessions. I remember us as kids, we'd always have uh, hymn, hymn sings. And as a 16, 17-year-old boy, that's the last thing I thought I'd ever be doing. But here I am singing with these other kids, singing these, these hymns because I was inspired, I was uplifted. I was taken to a different place. And to experience that was something tremendously more than anyone could ever tell me because it then became an unshakable thing in me. I could always go back and think about those things and, and use them as a, a jumping off point uh, for the, the things that I want in life. But the world doesn't appreciate God because they don't understand him, because they haven't been shown him. They haven't been given him in the way that you've been given him. Are we elect because God favors us? Is that why we are the elect? We are the elect because God called us and we responded. And we sit here not by accident, not by coincidence, but because we responded to the call that was given to us. Now me, I was born into this faith, and I can't be grateful enough for the fact that my mother married a, a man that she met in a parking garage uh, during a circus. You know, and I've told this before, but I still think they're crazy. You know, you take and blend uh, a family of four kids and two kids, and you blend them together after knowing the person for two months. Uh, I'm, I'm not even that crazy, but I'm glad that they were. I appreciate that they, they were led by the Spirit to each other and that we stand here and sit here now because of that. But the world hasn't been given those things like I have. They haven't been given the opportunities. Now, some in the world might. Some might have rejected it and walked away. But as a 70, my thought is that there are those out there that don't believe simply because I have not done my job in full. Because there are those that I haven't pre preached to. There are those that I haven't talked to because I've been ashamed. Or I've been scared. Or I thought, well, this isn't the right time. Or I've rejected the Spirit. But the world doesn't appreciate God because he is an abstract thought in their mind. And he's an abstract thought compared to what's in front of them. And they see what's in front of them. They see what they need or what they desire or their needs are somewhat clogged together with, with just once uh, or unjust once or whatever once they have. They've combined all those and they, everything becomes a need. But you know, the, uh, the world as we know it is too busy, too occupied for God. I'm going to read you a, a short little thing here. And I've read this before. I like it a lot. And it's kind of... Kind of an eye-opening thing. It's uh, Some of you might have heard it or read it on your own, but it's called Satan Called a Convention. And it says, Satan called a worldwide convention of demons in his opening address. He said, we can't keep Christians from going to church. We can't keep them from reading their, their scriptures and knowing the truth. We can't even keep them from forming an intimate, or we can't even keep them from forming an intimate relationship with their Savior. Once they gain that connection, though, with Jesus, our power over them is broken. So let them go to their churches, let them have their dinners, but let's steal their time so that they don't have the time to develop that relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what I want you to do, said the devil. Distract them from gaining hold of their Savior and maintaining that vital connection throughout their day. How shall we do this, his demons shouted. Keep them busy with the non-essentials of life and invent innumerable schemes to occupy their minds, he answered. Tempt them to spend, 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 and borrow, borrow, borrow. Persuade the wives to go to work for long hours, and the husbands to work six to seven days each week, 10 to 12 hours a day, so they can afford their empty lifestyles. Keep them from spending time with their children. As their families fragment soon, the homes will offer no escape from the pressures of work. Overstimulate their minds so that they cannot hear that still, small voice. Entice them to play the radio. And this is a little bit dated. It says cassette player. Uh, we could change that to, to, you know, Apple Music or whatever. Uh, whenever they drive, to keep the, the TVs on and their computers going constantly in their homes and see to it that every store and restaurant in the world plays uh, non-biblical music constantly. 
This will jam their minds and break that union with Christ, fill the coffee tables with magazines and newspapers, pound the minds with the news 24 hours a day, invade their driving moments with billboards, flood the mailboxes with junk mail, and every kind of newsletter and promotional offering, products, services, and false hopes. Give them the Easter Bunny so they won't talk about the resurrection and power over sin and death. Even in, the re in their recreation, or in the recreation, let them be excessive. Have them return from their recreation exhausted. Keep them too busy to go out into nature and reflect on God's creation. Send them to amusement park sporting events, plays, concerts, and movies instead. Keep them busy. And when they meet for spiritual fellowship... Involve them in gossip and small talk so that they leave with troubled consciences. Crowd their lives with so many good causes that they have no time to seek the power from Jesus. Soon they will be working in their own strength, sacrificing their health and family for the good of the cause. It will work. It was quite the plan. The demons went eagerly to their assignments, causing Christians everywhere to get busier and more rushed, going here and there, having little time for their God or their families and friends, having no time to tell them about the power of Jesus to change lives. I guess the question is, has the devil been successful at his scheme? You know, that was written quite a while ago because I remember reading that when I was a child. And it was true back then, but unfortunately it's only grown truer. Uh, there's more, more truth in that, especially if I look at my own life. We look at the lives of those around us and how often they're talking about all that they're involved in. Half the time I, I hear the guys at work, and no judgment on them, but half the time I hear the guys at work talk about you know, the, the shows that they're watching and how they can't, can't wait to get home to, to start binge-watching another series or this or that. Satan has been successful. You look at this world, how evil and corrupt and perverse and hateful it is. You look at Matthew 24, talks about the wars, of, the wars and rumors of wars and how men's hearts shall wax cold. If I were to say this to you a week ago, you would think something, but now even this week's even further because now we have the possible invasion of, Korea, uh, of Ukraine and the possible invasion of Taiwan. And if you watch the nightly news, if you watch one of the other news channels out there, the, the Fox News, the CNN, the, all these others, then you might have hatred in your heart towards another political group or another person. And what does it benefit you? What do you get from it? Why are we so involved in the politics of this world? When we know what's going to happen to this world, are you looking for the reestablishment of the, of the United States as we used to know it back in a time in a golden age that you perceive? Or are we looking for the establishment of the kingdom of Zion? The two don't go hand in hand. Something has to give in order to get to that kingdom. What is our desire in our lives? But we see that the truth of that, that little story that I read to you there. We see the truth of that in the world. But let me ask the harder question. How much truth of that do you see in your own life? How successful has Satan taken you away from that personal relationship with Jesus Christ? When I was a kid, I remember people go around and they would ask, do you, know, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And I always thought, boy, that's kind of, that's kind of silly. I don't, I don't know that that really hits home with people, that, you know, especially the people that don't know who Jesus Christ is to begin with. And perhaps there's a, 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 that's a stronger question for those in the, in the Christian world. Do you, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? But it hits home a lot more now than it, does, than it did when I was a kid because I've had that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I have it. And I'll tell you now, I know for a fact, I know for a fact, and no one in this room can tell me otherwise, that Jesus Christ is alive. I know that through him is the only way that I'll have a chance at salvation. I know that. It's been taken from faith and turned into truth. And I believe it with all my heart. And I, I will never walk away from that. But how much truth is there to Satan taking your personal relationship away from Jesus Christ and taking and investing you in other things. 
What value do you get out of those things? What value can you have in anything other than Jesus Christ? If you didn't know, the topic this, this morning is, uh, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we read that for the first time in Exodus when in the 20th chapter. When the Lord first gave those Ten Commandments to Moses on the Mount Sinai, and he brought them down to the people. And the first commandment obviously given was that thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I do believe that God is a God of order, a God of purpose, that he doesn't put things in an order for no reason. And I find it interesting that that's the very first commandment we're given. My wife and I once watched, a, or here recently watched a, a movie. It was a somewhat of a Christmas movie. And, and um, a girl meets a, a random guy in an airport and begins to chat. And uh, he admits to being a Christian to her. I say admits as if it's some horrible thing. He tells her that he is a Christian. And in their, their discourse, uh, he asks her if she's a Christian, if she believes in God. And uh, she says something to the a mocking effect of the, that uh, uh, she couldn't believe in a God that, that said, love me more, love me more. And uh, so she mocked God in that re regard. And I don't say that to cast shame on her or to, to doubt her because I do believe that she is someone that perhaps, or that character anyway, uh, perhaps doesn't, didn't have the same opportunities that I have. But the world does that, don't they? They look at God and they look at this commandment and they see the negative right off the bat. That God says, you can't have any other gods before me. And we automatically, as a, as a child, cross our arms and say, well, why not? I can do what I want. I've been given my, my agency, my free will to choose how I want. If you know anything about why God gave us our agency, it says in Genesis, it tells us that God gave us our agency not that we might choose what we want, but that we might choose him. And anything, any other choice outside of that, we fall under condemnation. God gave us our agency that we might choose him, not that we might choose the way we want. And so why is God so restrictive? Why is it that, that God commands that we put him first? Why is it that God won't let us have these things? If you knew something to be true, like really believed something to be true. There was no doubting it whatsoever. And you watch someone else try to lie to another person to lead them astray using the opposite view, uh, or using the opposite of that which you know to be true. Would you intervene? Would you intervene and stop them and say, whoa, 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 wait, 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 I know that's not true. Don't, don't listen to that person. Would you jump in? Of course, you would. Obviously, depending on the circumstance, but of course you would. You would try to help that person. What if that person being led astray was your child? How quick would you jump in and keep that person from leading your, your own child away? Our Lord, our Father, who we are his children, wants the best for us. And he knows that only he can save us. He knows that. That being said, why wouldn't he interject if he saw someone out there trying to lead us astray? And that's exactly what the adversary is trying to do. He's trying to take this world and shape it to where he can lead us astray and he can lead us to other gods and other things. And I remember as a kid thinking that you'd hear this, the commandments and you think, boy, that's a list of things I can't do. You know, it's, it's more do nots than anything. And the world looks at the commandments as a hindrance to their lives. They see do not, first and foremost. They they see, do not, that means I can't do something, and become irrational children wanting to rebel. If your child was about to walk off a cliff, you would tell them, don't go any further. Do not go any further. And that's what our Lord tells us. It's funny that the world wants to cast God as, a, as an evil dictator that, that tells us that we can't do these things. When in reality, the truth is that God gives us these things that we might find happiness, that we might find joy. He knows that, 
we were going to do this, that our natural man was going to lead us down a path where we would insert others in his place. And that when we did that, that we would find nothing but sorrow. And that we'd be taking, taken further away from him. So in Exodus, the 20th, 20th chapter, I'm going to read on. So we know that the first commandment was that thou should not have any other gods before me. And the second was like unto it in a lot of ways. Thou shalt not make any make unto thee any graven image or likeness of thing that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that which is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. I find it interesting. I'm going to spend a little bit of time in Romans here this morning. And we're getting close to the end there, aren't we? We were just talking about this out in the foyer that being a 70 means that you're automatically given 70 minutes. So I hope you guys are buckled in. So in Romans 1, 23... The Lord said in uh, professing them, I'm going to go to 22, professing them to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, whereas God gave them to, up to uncleanliness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And you see that that people have taken the natural things of the world and worshipped it. They've taken this and worshipped it, or that and worshipped it. And they've taken and replaced God. Man has and still does worship many false gods. And when I read that in Romans, talked about the, the beasts of the earth, or the, the, all the different things that, that are natural into this world, I couldn't help but think of Mother Nature and how that's become a thing. And that dates back to some time... Uh, uh, I believe Mother Nature was, was first in the, the 1200s was what I was reading. Um, but anyway, there was also Persephone. Uh, if you know anything about Greek mythology, there was Persephone, who was the, the daughter of uh, Demeter, I believe is how you pronounce that, who was the goddess of harvest. And they, uh, the world, in the Greek myth, in Greeks, they, uh, they believed that this Persephone was kidnapped by Hades and taken down to the underworld. And because the, her mother was the goddess of harvest, um, she didn't, because she was so worried about her own daughter, she didn't grow anything on the earth. And uh, so finally she was able to get her back, but when she was down there, she ate something that made her have to go back once every year. And so when she'd go back once every year, that would be the winter, because the mother would be so sad she wouldn't grow anything, and when she'd come back, that would be spring when everything started to blossom again. And how the world has taken and tried to create a narrative for these things that they don't understand, and they've replaced God. They've replaced the, the truth. And these delusions and false gods are created for a specific reason. They're created to separate us from God. I apologize, I keep doing that to you. But is it just false gods that are created to separate us from God? We make gods out of whatever we devote ourselves to. There are so many false gods out there uh, that we couldn't even start to list. If you were to make a list of the most important things in your life, where would God rank? Perhaps you'd tell me one. That would be great. That's what I'd want. But if we're being honest with ourselves, how often is God ranked number one in our life? Are there other things that, oh, you know, I'm going to put this off for now because I've got this to do. How many times do we, put, do we outrank God in our life on a daily basis? And if God does rank one all the time, that's great. How many other things on the list have nothing to do with God? How many things detract from God? The adversary might not get us, any of us in this room or any of us online, to worship a different God, but he might get you to deprioritize him or slightly change him in your mind, slightly change bits of truth and make them into untruths. But brothers and sisters, we have to be a, a spirit-led people. We have to be led by the Spirit. 
If we can be separated from God, then he will no longer be able to communicate with us through, through his spirit. And that's the way that the Lord comes to us and helps us in times of need. If he separates us from God so much that we can't hear his spirit, then we will be sheep that will no longer recognize the, the, the master's voice when he calls to gather us home. I want to read to you uh, from section R169. I can't tell you how much truth I, I continue to find in these revelations that have been brought to us, not just from President Larson, but also from Terry Patience. And in the fifth verse, it says, Stand on the many principles, of, or stand on the principles of my gospel, for they are true and designed to be a benefit to mankind. Many voices are coming forth and have been with you in the past that claim a better way. But I instill the only way to the Father. The voices and philosophies of men lead to destruction and separation from me. Seek to spend time in true worship of the Father, just as a flower follows the light. You must follow me. Open your hearts and your ears to the Spirit. Breathe. And let that spirit, and, and let that spirit I have sent you teach you. Expect the burning of the spirit to confirm what you hear. Brothers and sisters, listen to those words and let them be your guide. The Lord desires so much to be a part of our lives, to lead us, to send us down the right path. It's just incumbent upon us to allow him to speak to us. And that's by declogging our lives with all this other junk. Let's just be honest. There's so much out there that we put in our lives that Derek puts in his life that is junk, that has done nothing for me, that will do nothing for me, except for separate me from God, which will make me a worse father, a worse husband, a worse man. My charge and your charge is to become more like our God, more Christ-like, to allow every aspect of our life to be penetrated and infiltrated by the light of our Holy Spirit, or the, of the Holy Spirit sent from God, that we might take every aspect of our life and use it to Him. And really quick here, I want to end on, on a short testimony. Um, this is the first time I've been able to speak since I had COVID, and I, I've shared a lot of this with you guys, uh, with, with individuals in the past, but I just want to, I believe truthfully that when God gives us something, it's not for us as much as it is for us to share. And so I want to tell you about this, and I don't, I don't tell you this to, to, to bring attention on myself. I, I, I hate that thought. I, I hate the thought of, of ever being the guy that wants to get up here and puff my own chest and say, the Lord worked with me and pay attention to me. I don't want to be that man. But at the same time, I do know that the Lord gave me this testimony, and I want to share it with you. And I know I only have a couple minutes. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be long here. But my, uh, this whole thing started when my, when, when my oldest boy, Alex, uh, got sick and came home, and uh, we tested him, found out he had COVID. And so, of course, we had to, I had to report it to my work, and my, my wife had to report it to her work. And so they put us on a COVID vacation, as the guys at work call it. Um, they made us go home and, and quarantine. And uh, then our other son, Ethan, got sent home from school and uh, stayed with us as well. And then my daughter, we didn't send her to preschool. And so... Uh, we're all trapped in the house there, and of course, as you would have it, you know, as it, as it is, we all one by one got COVID and tested positive. I was the second one, and uh, so one by one we all got it, and then one by one everyone started getting better after a couple of days, except for me. I wasn't getting better. I was getting actually worse, and uh, I started coughing a lot and uh, had a lot of stomach issues and uh, couldn't keep food down, and so for about 10 days I didn't, didn't hardly eat anything, if, if anything at all and uh, uh, had a lot of, a lot of issues and, and whatnot. So finally, after a while, reluctantly, after my parents chided me for quite some time, and uh, after my wife chided me, we went to the hospital. And I did not want to do that. I wanted to try to get better on my own, but just I just could not kick it. So we went to the hospital, and uh, my breathing was, or my oxygen levels were, were right in the mid to upper 80s. So not horrible, not, not anywhere near what my, my poor brother uh, Roger Tracy had to go through and, and several others that had to go on the ventilators and whatnot. Uh, so I was blessed already in that regard. Uh, but I went into the hospital and so they admitted me and uh, they said, I'll probably only be there a couple days. It wouldn't, wouldn't be a big issue. 
And uh, so I went and didn't get to see my family those couple days and sat there in the hospital. And they only had me on a couple, couple liters, two liters of oxygen at the time. And my, my oxygen levels were staying up there right around 90. So it wasn't a big deal. And uh, I couldn't kick other certain problems that I was having with stomach issues and whatnot. And I couldn't sleep because of it. Um, and so finally, uh, and that was on a Saturday that went in, finally on Sunday night into Monday morning, uh, I started to get really bad fevers and started getting the chills and started having more stomach problems. And they said my heart rate was going up every time that I went to the bathroom. They said, well, you can't go to the bathroom now. And I said, what do you expect me to do? And so uh, they said, we'll bring you a, one next to your bedside. And so I had to do that. And that was nice and humiliating for anybody that's had to do that. Um, regardless, uh, got through it. But I just wasn't feeling good. I, w I wasn't feeling all that great at all. And it, you could tell I was going downhill a little bit. And, um, so my wife had my, uh, my dad and, and my mom and my brother, Chad, and, and my sister, Kristen, come over. And they were all in the house there. And Chad and Bruce got on the phone with me on a video call. And they prayed for me. And, you know, I, I never was all that horribly worried about it. But I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, there was a peace that came through that phone that touched me in a way that I can't describe to you. It was a peace that fell over me. And at that moment in time, I took all worry away. And I tell you, the scripture that was given to us just a handful of years ago that talked about the gospel going from the rooftops and Brother Terry relaying his, how, that, how that vision came to his mind with seeing all those antennas and knowing that the gospel can be communicated through these new ways of technology. Because God, God is the inventor of technology. He puts that intelligence into man's head and allows us to use it. Oftentimes we use it for false things. But in this instance, the gospel was being given through the telephone to me. And so that calm, that peace came over me. And I knew that I was going to be okay, that the Lord was going to take care of me. And I feel bad that my wife had to worry the way that she did. And that many of you, I, I, I got a lot of messages. I'll tell you, the, the prayers of the saints can't say enough for your folks' prayers and care and love if you've never been on the receiving end of the love of the saints in that capacity, I'll tell you, I, I don't want you to get COVID. I don't want you to have to go through that. But I hope that you all experience the love that the saints have in that regard. Because, boy, I will tell you, I am overwhelmed still thinking about the outpouring of love from you folks. You are my family. I know that for a surety. And I appreciate each and every one of you. But when I was in the hospital, uh, when they first checked me and I was dehydrated, my liver or my kidney function was low, my liver enzymes were up, uh, and they said I had right around 60% inflation in my lungs. And so uh, at, at that moment in time after my, uh, my dad and, and Chad prayed for me, the doctor came in and made some dramatic changes. It was a new doctor, and the old doctor was, was off, and, and uh, so she came in and took over. And when she came in, she immediately stuck me on 60 liters of oxygen and I uh, said, you know what, we're going to take you off all these other pills that you've been taking. Because I, I also have a, um, um, an autoimmune disease. And I also, on top of that, have high blood pressure. Um, thank you to my, my mother and my father as well uh, for the, the high blood pressure they gave me. Uh, but regardless, um, they took me off all that stuff. And she said, we're just going to see what happens. And so... As the days went on, it was pretty much the same. I worked on my breathing like they told me. I slept on my stomach like they told me. But they also sent me up to the fourth floor, which was a blessing because the nurses and, 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 who, and all those that worked on me, they'd been dealing with that for a long time, so they knew what to do. And that was a blessing in itself. And so uh, I had so many blessings in there that, that are hard to enumerate. But it really started about Friday. Friday night, I went to sleep. And I've been sleeping pretty well from that time on. I could barely keep anything down still. But as I'm laying there and I'm sleeping, I kept hearing the door open. And no one would say something to me. And they'd just come in and do what they were doing, and then they'd leave. And so I'm like, ah, they're not going to ask me for anything. I'm not going to worry about it. So I kept sleeping. And I went to sleep that night. Um, I, think, I think they turned me down a little bit. So I was in the 50s onto my oxygen level of 50 liters, somewhere around there. When I woke up, I was down to five liters of oxygen. And they said... I want you to know what we just saw with you was pretty crazy. When you were sleeping, your oxygen level would soar to 100. So we'd go in and turn it down a little bit just to see what would happen. It'd go right back up to 100. So we'd come in, turn it down a little bit more, and it'd go right back up to 100. And it did that all the way down to five liters of oxygen. And they said, looks like you're probably going to go home today. 
And it was just, oh man, that was the greatest thing ever because I missed all my children, I missed my wife, and I, I hated being in the hospital. Even though I was receiving all the blessings, I hated it. And so the Lord got me home. He blessed me in that regard. And I got home, and oh boy, I was weak, I was tired. Uh, it was hard to, to walk around the house without being out of air. And they sent me home with oxygen. But guess what? The Lord did me even one better. I only had to have one night with that oxygen. The next day I woke up, I didn't feel like I needed it. I was able to walk around. You know, I was tired and, and winded, but I was able to walk around and sit there and watch TV uh, without having to have oxygen on. And sometimes I'd sit there and I'd stare off into space and not even realize what I was watching for an hour, two hours or so. Uh, but the, the thing that tells me that the Lord was with me was the whole process only took about three weeks. And I've watched other people have to go through this. And, you know, they were talking about putting me on a ventilator and, and uh, talked about how those, those poor folks up there were like zombies. They didn't know what was going on. They just wanted a drink of water. They wanted something else. And I never had to get to that point. The Lord spared me that. And my heart goes out to those folks that are they're hit hard like that, that they, they have to go through something so horrible and that their loved ones have to experience what they did. But it, in just over a week after being released from the hospital, or I'm, I'm sorry, I went from, in just over a week, I went from being on 60 liters of oxygen to being back to work. I know that was the Lord. I absolutely know that was the Lord. And how blessed I felt, how much I realized I took for granted in that moment with my children and my wife. You know, I, I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, and I, I, I don't say this because she's sitting out there, but I believe that I have the greatest wife a man could ever have. I do. The love that I experienced from her, and I still feel it today. It brought us closer together, which I didn't think was possible at that time, but it brought us closer together, and it made me appreciate her as well as my children so much more. And each one of you, I ended up losing over 30 pounds in three weeks, too, so that was a, was a trying thing. But don't worry about that. I've gained it back, so we're good. But I want to end today reading in Romans, the eighth chapter. Because, brothers and sisters, I know that we are a blessed people. I look out at you, and I see the elect. I see the people that have been called to this place, this day, this time. And I see men that are great men in the, in the past that have done fabulous works for the Lord that wished they could be here in your place to see this day and this time. Because I truly believe, and I hope you do too, that Zion will be fulfilled in our life, that we will get to see it, that we will be ushered in with it. And that being said, I ask you today, brothers and sisters, what shall we say to these things if God be for us? Who can prevail against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for all, us all. How shall we not, or how shall he not, with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. He, or who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for, the, for thy sake we are, all killed, we are killed all the day long, and we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Could you bow with me? O oh God, the eternal Father, we come into thy house this morning grateful and thankful for not only to meet you here with the beginning of the song that we first sung together that Brother Eric chose as one of our favorite songs, but we know and felt your spirit come in and be able to rest our eyes upon our brothers and sisters and to greet them with love and joy. And then to be able to hear the Baker family that touched our hearts and to be able to hear my son, your servant, this hour and the words that he spoke that came from his heart and that you led him. He reminded us, Lord, of your words to be able to come unto thee with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. May it be so. May we fall down upon our knees at night each and every day and continue to thank you for those blessings in our life. And may we still continue to read, study, and obey and to look up with glad hearts for the promises that are given that you are coming back. And may it be soon I pray a blessing upon each one that's here that you might go with them in their rest and be with them in their abode and wait until we see each other again that we might have that joy. And in the name of